Academy of Arts and Sciences and Friends of the Arts Commons Foundation would like to welcome you to this evening's program. The Academy is a rather new entity for yachts, uh, but tonight's presentation is a perfect example of what we were trying to do, and that's to take advantage of some of the expertise that re resides within our own community and have them have a chance to speak and share with us their abilities and skills and what they've been doing. Uh, we have a very special honor to have two elders from the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayuslo uh, Indians. Elder Don Werat, the tribe's first historian, from 1989 to 96, he's an avid researcher and a prolific writer of his tribal history and culture. Recently, some 60 of his articles have been made available online on www.yahats.info slash history. Uh, they're fascinating reading. Uh, feel free to go through and read one a night. Um, Elder Werat, sitting right here in front of It's an honor to have you here, Elder. Also accompanying Elder Werath is Elder Doc Slider. Doc Slider is the chair of the Cultural Committee for the Confederated Tribes. He's played at the dedication of the Amanda Trail, and this summer he was featured in a seminar, uh, Indian Flute Music for the Yachts Music Festival, in its 30th anniversary celebration. It's very fitting tonight, since quite a bit of the program will be dealing with um, artifacts from their ancestry discovered and found in this area that Doc Slider will play a flute solo honoring the ancients. Thank you very much. Uh, it's always such an honor to come to this community to see all, all, all of the uh, uh, support that's in there, you know, um, and I say that every time I come, and every time I come, um, I even see more of it, you know. Uh, we need to bring all you people down to Keys Bay and North Bend, you know. <laughs> we need it. I'd like to play, uh, open this up by playing a, a song um, that's really dear to my heart, and it's called uh, Grandfather Song, and it actually is, is um, a native uh, song.
and the, the, the seas and raging and the, the skies are darkening, uh, that was the time that uh, tribal folks in the past went into their longhouses to uh, share stories of their tribal past. And it was that way that they uh, transmitted the history of their people to the next generation. So tonight, we're in our longhouse, <laughs> and we're going to be sharing some stories of um, things in the past. When I was asked to give a presentation about um, archaeology here on the coastline, I wanted, I have done no archaeology in Yahats. My first disclaimer. <laughs> well, I take that back, with a small exception of, of uh, excavating some materials that were suitable for radiocarbon dating sites that are on Joanna and Norman Cattell's property. I'm very happy to do that. But what I've been involved in in the last 20 some years is working for the Sanislaw National Forest as their forest archaeologist. Um, as you may know, the, the Sanislaw National Forest is a long, skinny forest the stretches from Coos Bay to Tillamaquid. It's essentially the footprint of the original Coast Indian Reservation that was set aside in 1855 to protect, to house, feed, train <coughs> tribal members in Western Oregon. And the people that were put onto this reservation, the tribal members in 1856, when they started populating this large 1.1 million acre coastal reservation were Indians from west of the Cascades, including tribal members from Northern California and southwestern Washington. Now we're talking tremendous language differences, cultural differences, food differences. Um, there's varied opinions about the effectiveness of the reservation period for the tribes here, it was devastating. For one reason, uh, after the Indians in Western Oregon were treated by the government, maybe they signed away their land, uh, Congress didn't ratify the treaties, and as a result of that, there was not monies appropriated to take care of the people on the reservation. Uh, Joy Cattell, and with the help of uh, Suzanne Curtis, has done a remarkable job pulling together uh, the true story of what happened here at the LC sub-agency, and it's uh, over on the table if you'd like to pick up a copy. Uh, Joanne has uh, recently updated this with new information, and she said, and it's being sold at cost. It's actually, um, actually the, the cost of, of putting this together. She doesn't gain any information that any proceeds uh, go to the tribes. And I, I think prior to Joanne tackling this issue, uh, which was really the beginning of a lot of health coming to the community and the tribes, um, not a whole lot of people in this area were really aware that Yahats figured so prominently in the Holocaust of the, the Indians who were here. Um, but I'll leave Joanne to tell that story. Uh, tonight, we're going to be taking a look at um, science on the Sayus National Forest that um, I had an opportunity to work on. They're all within oh, a 60 mile radius, they're easy, tra easy travel time. Um, some sites you can get to easily, some you may have to go by watercraft or hike into, but it's worth it if you'd like to see it. I picked out a few of the key sites that I thought you might be interested in. And then um, I, I pulled together a few historic photographs that I thought you might like to see that perhaps some of you have not had an opportunity to see uh, from the Lincoln County Historical Society. And we can end the discussion on perhaps uh, open it up for a discussion, um, if you'd like, about preservation of the cultural resources here uh, in Yamaha's. Because as we all know, these are non-renewable resources. They're never going to come again in the same way they are. And what I'd like to help you understand uh, is some of the information that we learned from uh, excavating, preserving sites and excavating portions of those sites. So, thanks to Greg Scott for his magic um, with the computer. So, let's uh, get started. As I started to say, the Sayuslaw National Forest is a long, skinny forest <coughs> stretching along the coastline. 
Um, Caton, this is a view north from Cape Capetula's scenic area, just to the south of us here. Um, one thing that is interesting as you go travel up and down the coast is just about anytime you see fresh water coming out into the ocean where there are marine resources available, you most likely have a site. Uh, somebody in, at some point in the past has been there to harvest um, or camp, or and oftentimes they'll leave uh, that material behind. And this is a midden. <laughs> this is a midden at Cape Perpetua. It's been uh, excavated so he could put, put a protective seawall on it. But essentially, a midden is a, uh, a refuge pile of anything that is um, is not eaten <laughs> and thrown away. Uh, these also serve as cooking platforms. And we'll be talking about that when we come back into uh, the Cape Perpetual area. But a wide variety of items show up in these sites. The lower part of the Saifson National Forest is uh, the Oregon Dunes National Recreation Area. Stretches for about 40 miles, starting from the uh, Saifson River net near the mouth down to uh, nearly Coos Bay. Uh, it's one big sand pile. We used to think that uh, these were relatively recent sand dunes that had built up since the end of the Pleistocene, uh, 12, 15,000 years ago. But uh, a recent study by Kurt Peterson at Portland State University and Errol Stock at uh, uh, Griffith University in Brisbane, Australia, have uh, <laughs> done dating in a very interesting manner using thermal luminescence, a technique where you wrap yourself in black and try to get down to the base sands. And then from that, the dating technique is actually relative to the light excitement on those sand crystals. But the result of this is we have, we now know that the Oregon Dunes, the sands have been building up on the Oregon Dunes um, National Recreation Area for over 70,000 years. Of course, as you're closer to the ocean, you're going to have more recent dates. But that was, was eye-opening for a lot of geologists. But in this particular area, there's a lot of them. The sand has created opportunities for the, the backup of water to create these wonderful inner dunes. And you can, it's a little dark in some areas, but you can pick out some of the, some of the lake country that is um, behind the four dune. Um, we'll take a look at one of the sites. It's up there on the, uh, on the far right-hand corner. This is one of the most interesting sites, I think, on the entire Oregon coast. And for many years, it was the earliest occupied site. It was, uh, it's on the uh, west side of Tackenich Lake. If I don't trip over the cord, um, I'll point it out here. It's right, right in this area here, right in that area. And um, when the Oregon Dunes was uh, congressionally designated or set aside in 1972, uh, and the Forest Service uh, took ownership. It was a private campground at that time with a floating dance lodge and a fish bait station and whatnot. Um, cultural resources were done in there because they wanted to make some improvements to the, to, the, um, to the campground that was there. And it gave us an opportunity to do a little archaeological testing. Uh, 